tell you what, the best ones, I think today was the one that you found me. You were you, I think you're the one that got it, and I said, where the heck did you get that thing from? I don't remember, but I went ahead and got one. Yours blinds me from up here, too. Yours is way better. That's the best one I've ever had. Oh, yeah. My father's probably getting one of these. And the nice thing is, I, I just charge my mobile. Just go. <laughs> hey, good morning, church. Welcome to our happy hour. Let's stand and worship. Set the captives free For who can stop the Lord 
You may be seated. At this time, let's, uh, let's talk to God in, through prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, blessed are you, O God, God of all creation. For you have brought everything into existence. You are great, and you are mighty in power. So we ask, O oh Lord, for you to be our strength in the times of weakness, to uphold us when we are down, and to protect us at all times. So Lord, we wait, we watch, we long for you. Renew our powers, refresh our spirit, restore our well-being. For you are the giver of new strength. And that strength you give to the faint, that power you give to the powerless. May your church be found working among those who lack resources. May your church be found of those who working among those who lack rights. May we seek to care for the ones who cannot care for themselves. Today, we, Lord, we pray for those who are lowly, for those who feel humiliated. and We pray for those who empower your goodness that people can be filled confident. So we pray for the great powers of the world, for the strong nations, for the mighty governments, and we may that their power be used properly, that the poor are protected, the weak are not exploited, and no one is oppressed. We remember those who have accepted that they will be in poverty, and they show their vulnerability for the sakes of others. Lord, you are a tower of strength. Great are you and mighty is your power. So Lord, we give thanks for all who have cared for us in the times of weakness. For those who have uplifted our spirits and given us a new hope. We pray for our friends and our loved ones, especially those who are finding life difficult at this time. We pray for any in our community that may feel neglected or rejected. We pray for all who are in the weakness of body, mind, or spirit, all who have come maybe to the end of their own resources. We remember all who are losing their mobility and agility, or those who are losing their memory and those who have lost a grip on reality. We pray for those who no longer trust anyone and those who doubt even your love, O oh God. God, we lift up to you the names on our hearts and minds, and, and we ask for those who are in illness to know of your presence, for those awaiting surgeries, for those in hospital, and those who are at home recovering. We ask that all may know the care of your love. And God, we give thanks that you sent your son to be our healer, our redeemer, and he doesn't allow us to be lost. So it is through gracious God that you build in us a confidence, knowing that we are loved and we are your children. And through this confidence, now we, now we may we raise our voices, bind them together in prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen.
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are, it's who you are. Whether it's our nature or DNA, we revert to the same thing. New Year's resolutions never take. Making changes in our lives is very hard. Do you ever think, is this what Jesus intended the church to be? Jesus established a church as a new thing, but our human nature always reverts to a priestly model from the Hebrew scriptures. 
we create sacred places, texts, and men, which create superstitious people. Every new thing eventually becomes an institution, even the church. In this sometimes unsettling five-part series, let's take a look at how we can return Christianity to the brand Jesus intended. Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I'm Buck Cuny Smith. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you as we worship God. I always think it's important on the first day of the week to assemble together and uh and that for those who are online and for those who are here, we're about to, at the end of our service, have communion. And if, especially with those who are online, you may want to go to the fridge and grab something if you want to have with us or, uh, you know, who knows, you might have something better than we do. So uh, uh, it's communion. And so with that, we celebrate that whether we're the church gathered or scattered, we are the church. And so I uh, thank you for being here. Um. Going to go off the little beaten path today, but uh, you know what I hate, and I know hate is a strong word. Uh, so let me. You know what I disdain. You know what. I, you know what I dislike. I, I dislike when anyone, anyone, mistreats one of my kids. I I, I don't like it. I, I I you know especially if they're an adult, right? They're my kids. They're precious. They've never done anything wrong or that they've told me they've done anything wrong, right? Some of you know that I ref soccer for high school and uh, the spring season is about to start in the March. And, and I was reflecting the other day. Of one, but the reason I ref soccer is that, to be honest with you, I was that parent. I was the one that yelled at the referees from the stands, I was the, the one that was quite loud, and that, so I decided then to stop the embarrassment of my kids, I would film their games. That put something between me and the game, right? And now, as restitution, I am now a referee at getting yelled at parents, and, and uh, only had one parent meet me in a parking lot after a game, but... but uh, but I was thinking about the one year, uh, my twins and Ben both played soccer, and uh, and it was my daughter's freshman year, and they pulled her out of a goal down in uh, in a tournament down in Ozark, Missouri, and uh, and I saw her, and she stopped, and she was ready to defend, and she turned, and then all of a sudden she collapsed, and she was in pain. And I knew from a previous experience what had happened. She had torn her ACL. And it needed surgery, and we had to go to Columbia. And uh, the, the surgeon that works with the Mizzou Tigers did it, and we had to do everything right. And when it came time for physical therapy, I said, who do you want for physical therapy? And she said, you know what, I, I want mom to do my physical therapy. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. It was a couple of weeks later, the other twin is playing defense and someone slide tackled her. That's with the studs up on the cleats and they just mowed her down. And I had already paid off one surgery and I am about to raise out of my seat and Colleen puts her hand on me and I, I ease back down. About that time, I noticed that one of the other parents, uh, one of the other moms stood up and she started yelling at the refs and she grabbed onto the chain link fence and things flew from her mouth that, to be honest with you, I have never heard before. <clears throat> and uh, the referee said, you're out of here. So one of the school administrators came and got her, and as they were escorting her out of the stadium, she walked right by, and I looked at her, and she made eyes with me, and I looked at her, and I said, I love you. <laughs> right? Because I care about my kids. And one of the things I hate is when somebody doesn't treat my kid right. They could offer me all the praises. They could offer me uh, an apology. They can offer me these things uh, to, to try and make it right. But if you mistreat my kid, I, 
I'm, o- I'm not okay with that. I'm off my soapbox now. So here's the sermon. <laughs> We're in the fourth part series of a sermon series and called Human Nature because it is our human nature to go back to a thing from the Old Testament, a thing that's worldly, whether you're Muslim, Islam, or in the mud hut regions of the world. We, we create a thing in our lives where we want to build something permanent. I call it the temple model. And, and, and what we've been studying for these four weeks is to understand that Jesus brought something new. Jesus brought a signal, something new, an end to the temple model. But what we've done, and as I explained last week, through 1,800 years of history, I know if you missed last week, you're like, Buck, you did 1,800 years of history? Thank God I wasn't there. (laughs) Is that what we ended up doing is blending Jesus' model with the temple model. See, the arrival of Jesus signaled something should have been the end of the temple model. See, our conscience has been shaped by a blending of both. Our approach to Christianity has been shaped by both. We refer to this temple model as, as I said in the first Sunday that we preached this series, is that we did an injustice when we took the word from Greek, ecclesia, meaning where we get the word church, but ecclesia means people. It means a fellowship. It means a believers. It means you and me. But, but when we transformed it from German, we use this German word, church, which means house of our Lord. That first week, I had you turn to each other because no longer is the building sacred under the Jesus model. The temple model made it so. But the Jesus model, now you and I are sacred. I had you turn to your left and to your right and tell your neighbor that they are sacred. No longer do we have to bring sacrifices to the temple. All we have to do is now sacrifice our love for one another. It's self-sacrificing. So there's no more sacred text. The temple model also brought about a sacred text. The Bible came in by a bunch of votes. Those who, who left with a no vote left as a heretic. And one thing that we do with Scripture is we always give it to a sacred man. And in the past, it's always been a man for interpretation. And and kind of what that has created is we want sincere followers, but we've created scared followers in some cases and superstitious followers in a lot of cases. That temple modeled through the sacred the sacred places, the sacred texts, the sacred men, and then sincere followers. The temple model happened right around the third century and worked its way back into the Jesus model. And as a result of this blending, we hold attitudes and approaches that hold us back. We hold, it holds the church back in the terms of influence and effectiveness. Last week, I went through a list of tendencies that we have that are caused because of a tendon of, of, of the temple model that's still with us, our thinking in the temple model. For example, I said, have you ever felt guilty because you missed church, but not feel guilty because you mistreated a, a co-worker? That's part of the temple model. Have, have you ever thought about how close you could come to sinning without sinning? See, that's part of the temple model. Uh, or, or this, do, do you believe that a ritual makes you right with God and move, removes your responsibility to restore it with a neighbor? See, we've used all of the weeks, and, and Jesus tells us that if you're in line to the temple to be relieved of your sins, but you still have a grievance against your brother, God can wait. Leave the temple, go restore your relationship with your brother that God can weed. All that is temple thinking. And here's why. And this is why in the previous weeks I told you that week three and four are going to be difficult. Sometimes you're going to say, Buck, that's enough. But the temple model 
results that the temple model is you-centered, me-centered. It's all about me and God. And we like to say, no, 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 Buck. No, it's about God. It's about my worship with God. It's about my relationship with God. And and me and God are tight. And and it is not you-centered. It's not me-centered. And we want to rebuke it. It's all about God. And, And it's never, it's never about God. Look at history. Look at other religions. Look at Greek mythology. It was all about how can I save my own self? It's about, yeah, I, I think about those seagulls from um, the Dora, the, the uh, oh, what's that turtle movie? The clownfish and all that, right? Finding Dory, finding, exploring Dory or whatever. I don't know what it's called. You know what I'm talking about. But those seagulls that are all about mine, 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 right? That's the temple model. The temple model is always about trying to keep God happy with us. The temple model is designated with the question in mind, this question, what must I do or what must I believe to make things and keep things right between God and me? Notice the two references to me and only one to God. It's the way we pray, isn't it? God protect me, bless me, heal me. I've got this going on in my life. Be me, me, mine, mine, mine. And especially since COVID, maybe this has happened to you. Temple, make, uh, temple mind thinking is, um, is maybe you've run into someone since COVID who hasn't been back. And, and you run into them in the grocery store and you talk to them and they may say something like this. I really should get back to church, Right? No one's heard that. No one's thought that. But it's an understanding that by coming here, by sitting here, and for some reason just sitting in the pew, all of a sudden everything's right with God. That's temple model thinking. See, temple model thinking is a it it gravitates to rules and rituals. You evaluate your understanding by your behavior. You ask questions like, what must I exactly do to make things right and keep things right between God and me? And when we start creating laws and rules and rituals, laws draw us to the limit of what we can do to get by with, right? Now, let me get a groan from you when I say, do you remember when the speed limit was 55 miles an hour? In the state of Texas, when I was a teenager, if you get a, your first ticket in your teenage years, you can take a class on Saturday called defensive driving, and it, it would get, be taken out of your record. Not saying that that happened to me. I had a 1969 El Camino Supersport with a 454 three-quarter inch cam and a 750 double pumper that when I started it up, the carburetor sounded like this. And you could see all the oil resources in the world just go, whoo. It was fun. I didn't say that. So I took this Saturday class, and what I found out from this highway patrolman is that he gave me permission to go seven miles over the speed limit if it was okay and I wasn't in the passing lane. I was more, well, I was less likely to get a ticket. I also found it was better that I didn't have a red car for some reason, right? We want to go straight up to the speed limit. We want to go seven miles over if we're told okay. We want to look at loopholes when it comes to rules. And look at at what we've evolved from. We, We went from 10 commandments to 638 rules all broken out from Leviticus of the Ten Commandments to create more rules of how you should jump higher or duck lower and all this Christian aerobics or obstacle course that we put ourselves into. And so temple thinking gravitates to rules and rituals. Laws compel us to identify and to exploit loopholes. 
we always try to find the loopholes and things. And in fact, I think this is the reason why I wanted to preach this sermon series is because it's what the outside looks at the church. Have you ever noticed someone who may not be a believer or someone who doesn't go to church are more judgmental of you who go to church? They call you a bunch of what? Hypocrites. Because they get it. They know that the way a Christian should act. They know what the, the model is. In fact, uh, in my first position in Houston, Texas, on staff there, one day I was at the church, I received a call, and it, it kind of went like this. Hey, do you know anybody in your church that drives a 1979 LTD, powder blue with a, a white, a white vinyl top? And I pretended, no, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, they said, well, you know, they were driving reckless, I honked at them, they gave me half the peace sign and pulled right past me, and uh, there was a bumper sticker that said, follow me to Aldine Bender, United Methodist Church. I said, I, I, I really don't. I'm sorry that happened to you. I know maybe that person was having a bad day. And then I hung up and went and told the pastor he needed to take the bumper sticker off his car. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But th that's the way the outside world sees the Christ believer. It is this understanding that we try to find the loopholes and we try to exploit the rules to, to better serve us. See, the Jesus model, not the temple model, but the new covenant, the new understanding, the new covenant, the new commandment, the new ethic, and the new movement that Jesus brought us, well, centers on the you beside you and not on you. That's it. It's simple. You, it, the well-being of people around you should shape your decision. This is why in the last couple of weeks I've talked about Paul in Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> this should be the, the rebel cry of the church. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 that says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Faith expressing itself through. Through love. At the end of that section in verse 14 from chapter 5 in Galatians, he says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment love your neighbor as yourself. See, com complete departure from the temple model. Have you ever had a discussion of why you should tell the truth? Right? You know, ask, ask that to someone, especially a church grower, right? Why should we tell the truth? Well, the first question is, they probably say, oh, it's a, it's a commandment. Thou shalt not lie, right? Or the Bible says that we shouldn't deceive others. Uh, the Bible says we shouldn't lie. And we get into the Bible says, and really, that's temple model thinking. The real reason we shouldn't lie is... We should recognize the worth of the other, that everyone deserves the truth. And everyone is worth the truth and not to be lied to. Have you, have you ever thought, or that, that why should we be generous? Oh, preacher, once a year, usually in the month of October, you tell us we all need to give, and you quote that verse, right? We want to go straight to the Scripture. God loves a joyful giver. Or you go to Malachi that tells we need to give 10% of our belongings and, and give that to the church. And we go straight to the scripture and be honest with you. That's temple model again. Why should we be generous? As there are people less fortunate. When we care for one another, when we, when we are an outpouring, when we care for those who, who maybe not have it or maybe need a meal, there, there's a time that we should be generous. Maybe, I don't know if we've ever asked this, I, I think it should be asked, is why shouldn't we gossip? You know? Well, because the Bible tells us not to gossip. But that's the temple, that's the temple version. We shouldn't gossip, gossip because it dishonors 
someone else. Imagine if we had to find a verse for every sin so we could say that's why not. And we've done that. See, the New Testament imperatives that are examples on how we should love one another. How we should love others as in Christ has loved you. The Jesus model is less complicated. (laughs) But it's far more demanding, isn't it? Oh, we have to love those people that God can only love. God can only love them people, people. See, it's easy to hide in the temple. It's easy to hide. Jesus tells that story, doesn't he? About two people praying in the temple and the Pharisee is saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. It's easy to hide in the temple where the, Pharise- the other guy is saying, God, I'm, I'm terrible. I haven't loved my neighbor. I haven't reached out in love. It's easy to hide in the temple. And I don't think that's what it, was, what it means. I don't think the Bible should say that. In fact, isn't that a defense that we normally do? Somebody talks to us about a tattoo or eating crawfish or shellfish, and what do they say? Oh, that's Old Testament. It's like we divide it. We create a loophole. But even when we do sin, it's okay because we can just go confess it later on. It's hard to hide from what what Jesus said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Wow. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus reminds us, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Luke chapter 6, verse 36 said, Be merciful as your Father is merciful. I love it when I talk with other pastors. And it's usually they talk to me about where I'm going, right? It's a nice way to tell me to go to hell, right? (laughs) They talk about heaven or hell, and they have these discussions. And and I said, hey, do do you remember in Scripture where our, who's our judge? Well, God's our judge. I said, no, the scriptures tells us Jesus will be our judge. Then I say, also, you know, what they call the judge bench? No, 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 what's that? And I said, well, the scriptures tells us that Jesus will be our judge and he will be seated at what is called the mercy seat. I think that's good news. That even if we're going to be judged and we, we, we make these stories in our head because of the temple model that we are going to be on trial with God, we know that Christ, who is merciful, is sitting in a mercy seat to judge us. We are going to be judged with mercy. See, love offers no place to hide. I think that's why people outside the church judge the church. There are no loopholes. There are no shortcuts. There are no workarounds with love. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't look for a loophole in loving me or you? We usually know the answer. And here's the question that I think needs to be a a daily question for us. What does love require of me? Can you say it? What does love require of me? That's the Jesus model. What does love require of me? And so our scripture reading today is kind of an interesting, uh, Jesus is speaking. He's speaking in Matthew 25, verse 31, and, and, and he talks about these things. But then he goes into this, he's telling the disciples, hey, if you've seen me hungry and gave me something to eat, then you're going to be on my right hand. And I think the disciples say, check. We, we saw you hungry. When, when we went to Zacchaeus' house and, and we went to Mary and Martha's house, you ate and we fed you. You, you kind of got on to that, that one sister who stayed in the kitchen way too long. But, but we fed you. And he says, then if, if you saw me thirsty and gave me something to drink, he goes, yeah, okay, check. Disciples were like, good, right? Check. 
We're, we've been good. We gave you something to drink at those two events. And, and at the woman at the well, you had to have a drink at the well. And then he starts saying, well, when I was naked, and they're like, oh, hey, man, you, you ever seen? No, no, what? You know, you gave me clothes. And then he, the, the one I think, I'm sorry about the way my mind works, folks. But when he says, uh, and when I was in prison, you know, they went, hey, what'd he do? They went straight to what he did. Why was he in prison? What did he do? What did he, what did he do? He says, then you came and visited me. And, and those check marks started to go away. And more questions started to arise. And then he just puts it there in verse 40. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. Ah. It's about the brothers of the other mothers. It's about the sisters that we have no genetic connection to. See, the Jesus model centers on you beside you. The devotion of God is illustrated, demonstrated, and authenticated by the love that we have for others. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for me, you did for the least of these. Did I ever tell you what I really hated? Is that when someone mistreats my children, and especially adults who know better, isn't that what maybe the view of what God sees today? Love the least of these. Treat my children as your own. What does love require of me? Let us pray. Gracious, most loving God, as we come to the table, the table freely gives of grace, of connection, of your presence and power. Empower us, O Lord, to love one another. Let us know of your presence, O Lord, through this bread and cup. So God, I ask for your Holy Spirit to come down on this bread and cup. And may it be for us the body and blood of Christ that, that by your presence, we know you are with us. You, we know that you are here, that we should have your same mindset as you love one another. And through the Spirit, as we take you in, O God, this bread and cup, let it be a reminder that we are your presence. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. We the ecclesia, the understanding of God with us in human form, the incarnation. And so, God, we welcome you into our midst. As we partake of this holy sacrament, let us be mindful of the connection, the forgiveness and the love that is shown. It is through Christ we pray. Amen. At the table, he broke the bread so it could be shared. After supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so it is through these mighty acts of simple, of grain and grape, that we are reminded that there is much more. There is love from our Heavenly Father that we are His beloved children. And we are asked to give that to others. And Bill, if you will come up, I'll serve you first. The way that we have communion here, it's an open table. Everyone is welcome 
to uh, the table in a United Methodist Church. In fact, I remind you, this is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is not Christ uh, United Methodist Church's table. It's the Lord's table, and all are welcome to it. We ask you to come down the center aisle. There are offering plates there. If you would like to give, you'll receive a bread and take that bread and dip it into the cup. And with that, we recognize, and then you partake, recognize God's presence with us and becoming in us as we become the body of Christ. There is a gluten-free option. It will be in the center podium for those just take one of those wafers, dip it in the cup, and partake as well. So, yeah. Bread of life. Cup of the new covenant. And all are welcome. Will you please come forward?
life of the church, we are expected to be apart because of a relationship we have to one another. I want to remind you of a special relationship that sometimes we don't always think of. Is, is that our daycare and our preschool. We have 90 kids in our preschool and our daycare that come through, their parents and them come through our doors every Monday through Friday. And uh, they're having a little fundraiser, which I want the church to celebrate. I want the church to be a part of. On March 3rd, they're going to a Mavericks hockey game, you know, the, the fight where the hockey breaks out. And if you, through our C News, if you click on that link and buy it, uh, I'd love for each Sunday school class to get in a section and organize and make it a church night there as well. But, but going, every ticket that is purchased through that link that's in our C News, $5 of it is going to be given by the Mavericks back to our daycare and preschool. And I want, I want to be a part of that. I want us to join in. We've got an awesome ministry here as well. And so if you don't mind, as if, you can, if you're able, please stand and I'll give the benediction. So go from this place with the peace, the joy, the hope that we have in Christ. Listen to this commandment. Love God, love yourself, love neighbor and stranger. And go from this place, place with the peace of God. Amen, amen. and amen.
Awesome week.